on a normal night. The debates would be the only news anyone would be talking about. But since Trump became president, there has been no normal night. So, today we're going to be covering the debate, and we're going to be covering the blockbuster impeachment hearing that rocked Washington, D.C. <laughs> so, first up, let's get into it. Tonight was the fifth Democratic debate, and it took place down in Atlanta, Georgia, at Tyler Perry Studios, where they filmed numerous <laughs> movies and TV shows. And I'll be honest, I'm just glad Joe Biden finally made it to the right soundstage, because for a while today, he was just wandering around in the background of other movies. Uh, <laughs> it was really awkward. Medea was like, give me one of those famous massages while you here. I'm tired as hell, Joe Biden. <laughs> now, at the last debate in October, they had 12 Democrats crammed on stage. Yeah, it was so tight, people could barely move. But then Spirit Airlines was like, hey, that's our thing. So this time... <laughs> The Democrats scaled it back down to an even 10. And the candidates were joined by four moderators who, for the first time this campaign season, were all women. Which, personally, I didn't even notice. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing, but I... I didn't even notice because I don't see color. <laughs> now, the major change... The major change from the last debate <laughs> is the rise of Pete Buttigieg, right? Mayor of South Bend, Indiana, and the only adult Michael Jackson would be into. <laughs> Over the past few weeks, he has surged from the middle of the pack to take the lead in Iowa and New Hampshire. So now, between Buttigieg, Biden, Warren, and Bernie, this has become a four-way race. And if you include Cory Booker, it's still a four-way race. <laughs> so, with Buttigieg riding in, rising in the polls, Tonight, the moderators asked him something a lot of people are wondering. Why should a teenage mayor from South Bend, Indiana, <laughs> become president of the United States? Mayor Buttigieg, let's talk about your record as a candidate. Why should Democrats take the risk of betting on you? In order to de defeat this president, we need somebody who can go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, who actually comes from the kinds of communities that he's been appealing to. I don't talk a big game about uh, helping the working class while helicoptering between golf courses with my name on them. I, I don't even golf. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I never thought I'd be on a Forbes magazine list, but uh, they did one of all the candidates candidates by wealth, and I am literally the least wealthy person on this stage. Yeah, Pete Buttigieg may be the poorest person on that stage, but Bernie was like, yes, but I look the poorest. <laughs> and that should count for something. <laughs> you know, it's actually funny how running for president is the only time people brag about how much money they don't have. <laughs> right? It's like they're all bizarro rappers, you know? Started from the bottom, never left. <laughs> started from the bottom and my whole team is in the exact same place because there's been no upward mobility for the last 30, 40 years in this country. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna lie. A lot of tonight's debate sounded exactly like what we've heard in the previous four. You know, Medicare for all versus a public option. Pragmatism versus revolution. Joe Biden versus his own mouth. But <laughs> one new thing we did see tonight was some brand new beefs, like Elizabeth Warren versus Cory Booker on the wealth tax. You know, I have proposed a two-cent wealth tax. That is a tax for everybody who has more than $50 billion in assets. Your first $50 billion is free and clear. But your $50 billion and first dollar, you got to pitch in two cents. I don't agree with the wealth tax the way that Elizabeth Warren puts it. The top one-tenth of one percent that I want to say pay two cents more, they'll pay 3.2 percent in America. The tax the way we're putting it forward right now, the wealth tax, I'm sorry, it's cumbersome. It's been tried by other nations. Two cents wealth tax and we can invest in an entire generation's right, let me let future. We Democrats also have to talk about how to grow wealth as well. When I stood in church recently and asked folks in a black church how many people here want to be entrepreneurs, half the church raised their hands. Yeah, and one guy in the back was like, nigga, what's an entrepreneur? <laughs> it's French for a businessman. Well, I don't want to be a French businessman. I want to be an American businessman. It's got a whole lot more je ne sais quoi. <laughs> So that was Warren and Booker arguing about wealth tax. Then there was a beef that really came out of nowhere. Kamala Harris versus Tulsi Gabbard. We have someone on the stage who is attempting to be the Democratic nominee for President of the United States, who during the Obama administration spent four years full-time on Fox News criticizing President Obama, buddied up to Steve Bannon to get a meeting with Donald Trump <laughs> in the Trump Tower. What yes. Senator Harris is doing is unfortunately continuing to traffic in lies and smears and innuendos because she cannot challenge the substance of the argument 
argument that I'm making. People, please, stop fighting. It's not worth it. Neither of you are going to be president. <laughs> what are you doing? That was the most intense argument I've seen in Atlanta that didn't involve Nene. That was really intense. <laughs> I also love how they're doing it with smiles on their faces. Oh, <laughs> well, the thing about you is I'm gonna break your face. <laughs> but please, but please, don't get me wrong. Tonight wasn't all about beefs, right? In fact, there was one moment between the candidates that was actually kind of sweet. First, I just want to stick up for Tom. We have a broken campaign finance system, but Tom's been spending his own money fighting climate change. And you can't knock someone for having money and spending it in the right way, in my opinion. Thanks, Andrew. No, no problem. <laughs> oh, Yang 2020. Everyone gets $1,000 and a compliment. I love it. <laughs> like, Andrew Yang is so nice. I bet he would have the best concession speech ever. He'd be like, I may not have won the presidency, but I won something more important, a friend. Thank you. <laughs> now, just like in previous debates, one of the most awkward moments of the night came courtesy of the original gaffe machine when he was talking about domestic violence. Joe Biden. No man has a right to raise a hand to a woman in anger other than in self-defense, and that rarely ever occurs. And so we have to just change the culture, period, and keep punching at it and punching at it and punching at it. There will be a big... No, I really mean it. It, it, make, it. It's a gigantic issue. What are you doing? What are you doing, Joe? Way. <laughs> he can recover from that is if he just starts making bad word choices his thing, you know? <laughs> he just needs to, like, dig deeper. He'd just be like, we need to get right to the heart of the drug epidemic. I'm saying get deep in the veins <laughs> of the drug problem. And when we do it, it's gonna feel so good. <laughs> so the candidates, once again, spent two hours tonight trying to show voters what separated them from the other people on the stage. But when it came to Trump, they were all trying to show that they were the same. We have a president who is not only a pathological liar, he is likely the most corrupt uh, president in the modern history of America. Read the Mueller report, all 442 pages of it that showed how the president tried to obstruct justice. Sucking up to Vladimir Putin every minute of the day. The president had to confess in writing, in court, to illegally diverting charitable contributions that were supposed to go to veterans. First of all, we have a criminal living in the White House. <gasps> a criminal in the White House? Someone needs to tell Donald Trump. <laughs> I bet he was watching this at home, terrified, like, oh, no, a criminal! <laughs> I hope he doesn't steal all this stuff I already stole! <laughs> but look, it was no surprise that at a Democratic debate, they were talking impeachment tonight. Because, you see, the biggest political story today was a blockbuster hearing in Congress where we heard testimony from Gordon Sondland, Trump's ambassador to the EU and Homer Simpson's body double. <laughs> He's the first witness to testify who spoke directly to President Trump about what he wanted from Ukraine. And today, he admitted, he admitted that, yes, Trump demanded a quid pro quo. Specifically, if Ukraine's president got dirt on Joe Biden, Trump would have a meeting with Zelensky in the White House, which shows you how bad Trump wanted dirt on Joe Biden, because usually Trump will do anything to get out of a meeting. Yeah, one time he even called in a bomb threat. It was like, hello, White House, this is Mr. Al-Qaeda. <laughs> I'm calling in a bomb threat between 3 and 4 p.m. in the conference room, but keep the donuts there, I'll eat them later. <laughs> and here's the thing, here's the thing. Not only did Sondland testify that Trump ordered a quid pro quo, he testified that basically everyone in the administration knew about it. Everyone, seriously. He threw everybody under the bus. Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence, Mick Mulvaney, John Bolton, John Bolton's mustache. Even John Bolton's mustache's mustache. <laughs> but there's one man in particular that Sondland put at the center of the whole scandal, Rudy Giuliani. Secretary Perry, Ambassador Volker, and I worked with Mr. Rudy Giuliani on Ukraine matters at the express direction of the President of the United States. We did not want to work with Mr. Giuliani. We worked with Mr. Giuliani because the president directed us to do so. President Trump directed us to, quote, talk with Rudy. Let me say again, 
We weren't happy with the president's directive to talk with Rudy. We did not want to involve Mr. Giuliani. Oh, God damn, nobody wanted to work with Rudy Giuliani? <laughs> you know, Sondland was talking about Rudy like he was like that weird kid that your mom made you play with. Remember that kid? <laughs> yeah, and then that kid would always get you in trouble and you'd be like, Mom, I didn't want to play with Rudy in the first place. You said I have to. Then he wanted to microwave a dead pigeon. That's not my fault. <laughs> Like, I would, have, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall when Rudy Giuliani watched that testimony. Although, if there was a fly on Rudy's wall, I'm pretty sure he'd eat it, so maybe not exactly, but... <laughs> but you know what I mean. So today's hearing was very bad for President Trump. So much so that he came out of the White House before the hearing was even over to defend himself. And I gotta say, he seemed a little shook. Just a quick comment on what's going on in terms of testimony with Ambassador Sondland. And I just noticed one thing, and I would say that means it's all over. What do you want from Ukraine? He asks me, screaming. What do you want from Ukraine? What do you want from Ukraine? I keep hearing all these different ideas and theories. What do you want? What do you want? And now, here's my response that he gave. Just gave. Ready? You have the cameras rolling? I want nothing. That's what I want from Ukraine. That's what I said. I want nothing. What, I what is Trump doing? That was one of the least presidential things I've ever seen. He, he just looked like that, that crazy dude in the neighborhood who's yelling at everybody on his front lawn. If I find out who's been taking my newspaper, I swear to God. Like, Trump is the only president to bring down the property value around the White House, <laughs> right? You can see, even the white people next door came out to see what the commotion <laughs> was all about. You can see in their faces, like, oh, my God, Donald is out there again. Like, I, I don't know. I miss that lovely black family who used to live here. <laughs> this, this guy is a problem. He's, he's a problem. And you realize the worst part is that Trump was reading all of that from notes. <laughs> like, that wasn't Trump freestyling. That was Trump prepared. <laughs> now, look, I'm no trained lawyer. I'm no trained lawyer. But I feel like innocent people don't need notes to remind themselves that they're innocent. <laughs> like, you never see defendants in a courtroom like, can I just say, Your Honor, I did not murder my wife. <laughs> so, look, this didn't make Trump look good or innocent. In fact, he said the same lines so many times in so many different ways. It almost felt like he wasn't being presidential. It felt like Trump was auditioning to play the character president who is innocent. Ready? You have the cameras rolling. What do you want? from Ukraine. What do you want from Ukraine? What do you want from Ukraine? I keep hearing all these different ideas and theories. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? I hear all these theories. What do you want, right? I want nothing. I want nothing. I want nothing. I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. I want no quid pro quo. I want nothing. I want nothing. I want nothing. Thank you, folks. I think he nailed it, people. He's getting the job. We'll be right back. <laughs>